So we've expanded the panel around the table. Uh, two more entering the frame. Michael Adams, pollster with N. Veronics, author of his latest book uh, called Fire and Ice, examining the values of uh, Canadians and Americans. And Krista Taves is also with us, who is a Unitarian minister. Um, you believe under no circumstances that you That's could correct. take another human life? Um, I would believe, and also the uh, Unitarian Universalist Association and the Canadian Unitarian Council believe that you have an inherent worth and dignity, and that just simply can't be taken from you. It's not something that you, you know, you forfeit, or that can be violated and taken from you. So we. So even if you commit the most heinous crime, correct, correct you have not lost your right to your own life. Now, Michael, Canadians and Americans have different systems. I mean, mm. we can still execute people in the United States, not in Canada. Do, do the populations have different points of view? Because you've polled them. Yeah, the uh, Canadians are uh, much less in favor of the death penalty than Americans. In fact, the uh, proportion of Canadians has declined 20 percent in the last 20 years. Who but it's still in, a majority, in, is it not? Yeah, it's 60-40. Uh, and uh, but that's down from 80-20. So that's part of that is kind of generational replacement. Older people having more traditional values. You know, good guys, bad guys, right and wrong. Establish moral superiority and <laughs> blow them away. It is. It is a. You know, it's a, it's a traditional mindset. Uh, but uh, as but you then get you've got a government who change. You know, has has a position on this. I mean, should the government listen to the people on this? Well, uh, it's interesting. We. You know, you compare Canada and the United States, we have about half the population are social liberals. And, and, it, and it correlates, you know, attitudes on, on capital punishment and, and uh, other, other uh, socially liberal points of view uh, highly, are highly correlating. You know, I mean, we're, I spent the summer being interviewed and, and by Americans wondering what's going on, uh, legalizing small amounts of marijuana, you know, where uh, same-sex marriages. I mean, the, the movement in Canada to social liberalism has been remarkable over the last 25 or 30 years. And not in the States. Uh, and, and it parallels uh, Europe. In fact, uh, you know, we're a North American country with very much European values. And we're very much in line with uh, a European. I don't know, are there any European or Western European countries that uh, have the death penalty? Yeah. So we're kind of in line well, with the United with States is, is, is alone. It's among the exceptional. In the, in the European Union, you culture. actually cannot be a member of the European Union until you have officially abolished capital punishment How from the books. Uh, why is it that the U.S. is the only Western country that still has the death penalty? Uh, I'm surprised you didn't say the only Western democracy, because that's the way it's the question is usually posed because, of course, the irony, you, you just heard the concession that 60 percent of the Canadians, and from my informal poll of your staff here, um, probably 60 percent of your staff are also in, in favor of the death penalty. H how remarkable it is that, that we in the United States should be under attack for being the only Western democracy when, in fact, history shows us, and uh, I'm sure they will concede, that every European country that abolished the death penalty, and, and also Canada, abolished the death penalty while a substantial majority supported it. And in fact, the polls still indicate today that, so that majorities be either bear or substantial support the death penalty in Europe as well as Canada. But so, you say well, in your own country, though, let me just add this, uh, that a politician would be hard-pressed to get elected unless they, even if they lie and say they're in favor of it. So who's, you know, if the leaders say I'm opposed to it, who's being truthful, leaders who lead or people who say what they think they want to uh, be told in order to get elected? The People are speaking. That doesn't make them right, but the people are speaking. So that when you ask the question, as you are, why are we the only Western country, or impl implicitly, why are the only, we are the only Western democracy, the short answer is the United States of America is the only Western democracy acting like a Western democracy. In every other situation, including Canada, what you have is the elites who are running the show, the elites who think that it's in the people, the elites who have the view that it's for the people to catch up to well, them. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to mention what you were saying about the polling, that even though 60% of uh, Canadians may be in favor of capital punishment, and you had uh, uh, Canada's right, the uh, former Alliance Party, wanting to hold a national referendum on the subject. And I would move that if uh, the Alliance was to have a national referendum on taxation to abolish all forms of income tax and revenue the government has in Canada, that a vast majority, more than 60% of Canadians, would vote in favor of that. Now, is that right? 
So whether or not Canadians are actually in support of this or not, the, the underlying factor is, is it right or not? Is it anti-democratic? It's, not as, it's yeah. not as salient in Canada. You know, if you look at our crime, our violent crime statistics here, you know, an American is three times as likely as a Canadian to be the victim of homicide. We, violent crime in Toronto, uh, well, homicides in Toronto, this city we're in, 25 uh, per 100,000, and, and Chicago is 325 per 100,000. So the whole climate... Of, of fear of crime, of, of, of feeling that you might be a victim of crime, is much different in uh, the United States than it is in Canada. When we ask people, okay, if you have an alternative, uh, which would be you know life imprisonment and so on, rather than uh, the death penalty, th the country is split. Um, and it's true. There is the. It's, it's interesting too, of course, the, the democracy. We are a parliamentary democracy. Uh, Canada has not had the initiatives and the recalls and the total recalls that America thinks is democracy. Of course, you can debate whether or not that is democracy or is it mob rule. This was, of course, the huge debate we had when we formed our country because no, we are a we, republic we, as you. We have yes. representatives as no, we're as, not a republic. Well, let me ask. I want to ask Krista something. If the, if the polls in Canada are 60-40, do you think? Well, I'm part of the 40, and the the 40 have the higher moral ground. Mm -hmm. Is that how you, well, is that how you view it? Well, I think that sometimes it's very, very dangerous to allow a majority opinion to, to decide what the country is going to do. I mean, for instance, with same-sex marriage, we've decided our courts have ruled it to be unconstitutional, whereas a significant majority of Canadians believe it should not be legalized. Who's right? I mean, but the courts are working on laws that have been enacted by Parliament. So it's simply, it, it's, it's worked its way through the legal system. One of the things that I'm very struck by, and that I was struck by while I was watching the ori initial part of this program, was how sensationalistic capital punishment is as a subject. When you're describing the crimes committed by these individuals, I found it to be incredibly sensationalistic and aimed at bringing out the worst in me. It was supposed to make me feel like revenge. I'm supposed to want this person to die. It is supposed to be the right thing. And I think that capital punishment, when it's legalized, it, it reinforces those negative characteristics in all of us. It becomes a social example of what is an appropriate response to violence. And then it becomes socially confirmed through the political system. And I felt really a, a strong response to the way you were sharing that. I wanted, to, I, I wanted to mention just something on that, too, when you were mentioning about Mr. Rawlings. Again, it was an emotional-based response. Your anger and disgust at the crimes he committed was what was driving you, essentially, to feel mm -hmm. that he needed to be executed. It didn't have anything to do with protecting society or enforcing justice. It had to do with making you feel better, making you feel that you would accomplish something to get over that disgust that you felt by the crimes that he committed. When the criminal justice system is there essentially to protect society, that is to lock the person up for a life term, throw away the keys if they're a Danny Rawling, but to protect society, not to enact revenge against the person on behalf of the, of the victims or, or involved. Or retribution. But it would, you know, let me just ask you about the place of emotion in this I'm, I'm debate. I'm delighted you did, and I'd like to sort of combine a response to all of what's come up. Emotion plays a critical role in, in an appropriate jurisprudence of the death penalty. Now, there's no universal agreement about that, even among proponents, nor is there a universal opposition to that among opponents. That is, increasingly, it's understood that emotion is a vehicle for understanding and action. One doesn't have to be in favor of the death penalty to embrace that. One view has it that this is all supposed to be rational. The whole thing is supposed to be bloodless. The whole thing is supposed to be ideological. It's supposed to be removed. And that's sort of the suggestion, that how you responded, yes. Do I hate Danny Rowling? Yes, I do. Should, should a jury condemn someone to die unless they are angry, unless they hate? No, they should not. At the base, the question of the death penalty is a moral question. And as has been understood by sociologists, by great philosophers like Adam Smith, not in his Wealth of Nations, in his, in his Theory of Moral Sentiments, published 17 years earlier and for which he was justly more famous in his lifetime, at base, every moral question is an emotional question. So yes, you heard it. And just like love counts, so does hate. And just like love and, and is part of celebration, and celebration has a crucial role in life, so does anger and condemnation. They are, they are twin sources. And then it gets us back to what the purpose of society is, if I can just finish just as one sort of response to, 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 to all of it. And that is, is the purpose of society to keep us safe? Partly, but only partly. 
part of it is future orientation, part of it does involve a cost-benefit analysis, part of it is incapacitation, part of it is deterrence, but also part of the purpose of society, one of the fundamental purposes of society, is to do justice. And at the core of Western culture, from the very start in the ancient Greeks and the ancient Hebrews, from the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground, we have this intuitive, moral, emotional sense that the dead have placed a responsibility on us to act. Okay. Let me just get these two in. Well, I think that have we evolved past that? Is a civil society defined by our ability to say, "Okay, we we felt that we've gone beyond that"? Yeah, I think so. I think that there is a place for anger, there is a place for sadness, outrage, moral outrage, but there's a very big difference between feeling those emotions and then allowing our decisions to be based on those emotions. Right. And I think in a civil society, we need to be able to move beyond those emotions, give them their place. What is their place? I think their place is in the heart and the soul. I think that they're in a society which is fundamentally wounded. When we use capital punishment as a response to those feelings, we're scapegoating those feelings. And we're not really looking at the larger social um, milieu surrounding crime and violence. Are those individuals who committed those crimes responsible? Undoubtedly they are to be held responsible for their crimes. But their crimes are also larger than they are. And when I go to the United States, and I've spent a considerable amount of time there, I feel as if I'm in a country that is f grounded on fear and violence. Michael? Well, uh, there's, you know, we have 100 people for every 100,000 in prison. America has 700 people for every 100,000 in prison. And in terms of the emotion, moral outrage issue, well, too, look, and feeling and how that guides. I try to correlate. You know, I correlate with this re with religiosity, you know, and, and the mar far more fundamentalist uh, orientation to religion. Old Testament, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. We're more New Testament or post-New Testament or all the religions of the world and we'll, like our multiculturalism, pull a little bit from each one of them. There's one of the questions that we put to Canadians and Americans and it's, you know, these old saws of, of a penny saved as a penny earned, agree or disagree. Spare the rod and spoil the child. And that, people in the audience would have heard of that, we grew up with that. It was once thought that you weren't a proper parent unless you were willing to administer uh, corporal punishment on your children. And now, more and more, as we move, as we civilize, uh, maybe we're getting soft, I don't know, but having to hit your kids is not a proof that you're a good parent. It's an avowal of failure. And let me tell you that as you look as a I cultural anthropologist, that, but... you correlate these things, and a story emerges, and the story of Canada moving in one direction and America moving in another direction, in fact, reverting kind of to the way it was in the 19th century, rejecting the New Deal and the social welfare state, it, it, it makes sense to me that America is moving in the trajectory that it is. It's a very different society. It's a very different culture. And we are not merging our values. We're getting more distinct. But that's, that's just not true in the death penalty context. If you look at the way America is moving in the modern era of the death penalty, both in the United States Supreme Court jurisprudence and in the reaction of the states to what the courts require, you see a movement in just the sort of direction you want. You may not see the abolition of the death penalty, but what you are seeing is the progressive restriction of the death penalty. Oh, no. And what you are I... seeing, and what you are seeing is 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 the the increased sensitivity to the mistakes that can happen with the death penalty. And what you are seeing is the increased rights that are being granted to those who might face the death penalty. What you are seeing is an increased sensitivity to the liabilities that local prosecutors and politicians face when they improperly impose a death penalty and at the same time saying that it's becoming more progressive now there was recently a case in Louisiana of a man who raped an eight-year-old girl who has been sentenced to death solely for a rape he didn't kill anybody but apparently on the books a few years ago in Louisiana they passed a law that said anybody who rapes a child can be eligible for capital punishment they just recently sentenced someone in Louisiana to death this is the first death sentence of someone who's committed an act other than murder since they brought back the death penalty I hear stories about now uh, the new anti-terrorist legislation being used against crystal meth dealers because there were chemicals in their uh, in their laboratories that are, co are covered under the anti-terrorist act who also may face a death penalty as a result of being charged on the uh, under the anti-terrorist okay, so act. Okay, so look, let's look at oh. that. Look, can we look at that? Very Whether, briefly, the, then I'm going to break and we'll come back. Okay, Louisiana, you talk about Louisiana. Yes, Louisiana is the only one that has a child rape death penalty statute uh, on the books. Um, the first case that came to the Louisiana Supreme Court was one of Bethily. Bethily raped three children, nine, seven, and five, one of which was his own, while he was HIV positive and knew it. The question was, does Bethily deserve to die? Can anyone who does not kill 
be deserving of death? Well, this recent the answer case. was, well, I, know, I know this recent case, we but this each, is the first. We end each segment with one of your dramatic stories. These are real. Well, yeah, this is what's happening. I'm not making this up. Let's not forget but, who gets the death penalty and who should get Who okay. should get Because who does get it and who should get it are not the same group. And this is where Dave and I have much common ground. Okay. Well, we'll be back. And we'll try and I see where that exists, the common ground when Test of Faith returns. <laughs>